I'm making some pretty good progress on cleaning up this Filco 15DX chassis. First, I removed the variable tuning condenser. Had to unsolder a few connections along the bottom and the wires to the uh, shadow meter and the backlight for the dial. And then I had to remove two bolts from below. And these were the ones I really wanted to get at with these rock hard uh, shock mounts. These are supposed to be very pliable, nice and soft. Hunted around online a bit and I think I found some suitable replacements at renovated radios. It's also one that goes on the back side. So there's two big bolts that go through the bottom and there's a third support along the back. A piece of angled metal. Kind of gives it a little more stability. Otherwise, this is fairly clean. I used a little bit of navel jelly, applied with Q-tips here and there just for some minor surface corrosion. Also cleaned up the shadow meter a bit. I think I might actually go so far as to unmount it because these screws are kind of rusty here. And uh, might be a little bit of dust and debris inside there. But otherwise... Uh, oh, and one other thing I did, I uh, uh, cleaned out the bearing points with some WD-40. Put in some lithium grease. Same along the little pulleys on the dial string, so it's all working quite smoothly now. Alright, so otherwise that's in good shape. As for the main chassis, with that out of the way, I was able to get in here and actually things were not bad at all, just some dust for the most part. I cleaned that off with a damp rag. A little bit of surface corrosion here and there. Used some navel jelly Q-tips, pretty much got all that off. Now I suppose I'll get some metal polish and just lightly go over this. I'm not going to go too nuts with it. I will clean these up though. Um, pretty shiny. I've already did a little bit of preliminary work on them. These are all aluminum and they clean up, uh, polish up really well with Simichrome. And as I'd hope with that tuning condenser out of the way, it's very easy to get in here with a rag and even without having, without unmounting these just to work my way in, around, in and around. No problem. And uh, once that's done, I think, well, I'll, I'll double check underneath. If it's not too much work to unsolder the wires, I'll remove this for painting. Otherwise, I'll just mask off this area and spray it in place. And then uh, that just leaves rebuilding the two tuning caps. Too bad these caps won't fit inside, as I mentioned a while ago. These are plastic film caps, um, 6.8 microfarad rated, 450 volts. Now, of course, I can use electrolytic caps. I just kind of like to use these in old radios when I can because these will last even longer than a, a modern electrolytic will. And you can also get these now in voltages, I think, up to 900 or even more. There's a new line of AVX high-capacity film uh, capacitors at the Mauser. And DigiKey has some similar capacitances range from, I think, 2.2 or so microfarads up to maybe 10 or 16 with voltages, I think, uh, at least up to 900, maybe even 1100 volts. Because on some of these old radios, the very first filter cap after the rectifier tube, when you, when you turn it on, it can definitely surge over 450 volts. So I've seen some discussion about using those here and there online in these old radios. But, uh, can't use those blue guys. I could possibly, as again I mentioned a while ago, use these. Fortunately, these are only 2.2, but they are rated for 630 volts. The originals were 6 microfarads. So I could put three of these in parallel, and these will fit inside the copper cap. Otherwise, I can just place another order with Mauser or DigiKey or whoever and get one of those new high voltage, high capacity film caps. Which uh, I'd have to double check. I think some of them would be small enough to fit inside these cans. If all else fails, of course, I can just mount these as they are, don't restuff them, and stick the caps underneath the chassis. That uh, reminds me when I rebuilt these Bakelite blocks. I didn't fill them back in with tar or wax or hot glue or anything. And for the most part it doesn't matter because they're all 
covered off completely by metal, but I noticed this one uh, is underneath a large opening here, so I am going to take some black hot glue and squirt it in there and fill this up so you can't see that cap anymore, similar to what I did over here. I've moved on to doing a little work on these Wheeler replacement speakers, and I found that they're not actually in as good a condition as I originally thought. The cones look okay, but I'd noticed the spiders were a bit deformed, like they're pushed down a bit further than they should be. So I was playing around with seeing how well these cones actually move, and the larger one isn't too bad, but it can definitely go up further. So if I carefully, gently push from the bottom, they can go up quite a bit more to the point where the spider kind of straightens out. See the spider's kind of mushed down and it's got a kink on one side. So I wonder if over time uh, the speaker ha cone has maybe shrunk a bit or or something. Because um, I think even if that spider was in good shape it wouldn't have quite enough tension to pull this up. Because I have to put quite a bit of force on this to get this cone to come up all the way. And uh, when it's kind of in the it's at rest position like it is right now, it can go down a bit, but not as much as I think it should. In other words, I think when there's no power applied, the cone should be up further. And then, and then when it's powered up, it has more would have more room to vibrate. So I don't know if that's uh, maybe the maybe the surround doesn't have enough uh, tension on it to pull it up, or, or what the deal is exactly. Yeah. Never done a speaker recone. Obviously they play, because you've heard the radio playing, but I think it, these could be performing a bit better. Now the smaller speaker is even worse. So I noticed when I uh, was cleaning this up, I tried pushing down on it, and it, uh, it wasn't going down at all. And when I carefully stick my fingers in this one and kind of push the cone out... Uh, it's much harder to do. The cone kind of like sticks in place. There seems to be a lot of friction on the voice coil, in other words. No corrosion, uh, no obvious dirt, or at least not much corrosion. Uh, far less than the original speakers with this radio. So, uh, not quite sure what to do with these. Uh, this one looks like it'd be actually fairly easy to disassemble. There's a metal ring that goes around the cone. And there are uh, one, two, three, four, eight crimp points. I think if I unbent these crimps, took that ring off, uh, undid the center nut, and unsoldered the voice coil wires, I think I could actually pull this whole cone and voice coil assembly out without disturbing it. That's assuming that this cone is not glued down to the metal and it's just held on by this metal rim. Now even if I did do all that successfully, I don't know that it would get me anywhere, but I figure at least I could see what's going down, what's going on down in that voice coil, and if there is any debris or rust in there, I could maybe free it up. Which leaves me kind of torn, because these kind of work as they are, and the other speakers are a bit must up too. All I really need is one good working pair. Um, and I, So I went back and I looked at the original speakers that came with this radio and you know they don't look all that bad so I figure what I should do is decide on one of these pairs and uh, have it sent out to be worked on by someone and if all else fails and they're not repairable they don't have the right uh, parts or whatever then I've still got the other pair to go with so I think I'm more inclined to keep these as they are, kind of functional, and see about getting the originals um, reconed. So I'll, I'll mull that over while I continue working on the rest of the chassis. I decided to have another look at the original speakers that came with this radio. A couple uh, segments earlier in this restoration series, I talked about these speakers and how uh, the one of them, the like the voice coil, was frozen up. 
Well, I actually recorded that footage some months ago, and I just never got around to posting it, so it's actually been a while since I took a good look at these speakers. So now when I compare them to the Wheeler speakers I was just showing you, it turns out that this larger speaker actually has a better travel to it. I'm sure the cone's torn and it has a uh, it's deteriorated, but the spider's in really good shape. And uh, a little bit of scraping, but it has a better travel. It seems to move more freely. So uh, I'm going to try to get some compressed air, blow the debris out. I've got uh, some service cement for speaker cone repair I picked up recently. I give that a shot, patch that up. I've certainly repaired speaker cones before. And I figure, what have I got to lose? Uh, I was thinking about getting them reconed anyways. I might as well see how they sound uh, just with a little bit of patch up. Now, this is the one I showed in uh, the earlier segment where I said that this was like frozen. I couldn't move the voice coil at all. Well, I worked at it a bit more, and it turns out that, yeah, if I get a good hold of it on either side, it'll move. It's scraping a bit, sure. But that might work itself loose a little bit, and again, I can try blowing some compressed air down in there and clear it out. And I can tell this frame got a bit rusty down in there. So I imagine that's rubbing a little bit. And obviously it's got some tears, but again, I can try gluing those up. So I think what I'm going to do is clean and glue these up as best I can, and let's fire them up, see how they sound. And uh, whichever pair maybe sounds better for now, I'll put back in the radio and have the other two uh, sent out to someone to see what they can make, uh, what they can do with them.